Hi everyone, welcome to another Gaffering Gear. Today it's another gear review. We're having a look at the Lupalux Dayled 2000 Dual Color Pro. So this is a bicolor light, 200 watts. It boasts DMX and battery operation. All right, so I'm gonna start off with a quick pickup shot. I completely forgot to mention all the way through the video what the Kelvin range is on the light. So it's 2,800 Kelvin up to 6,500 Kelvin. Okay, let's get into the review. All right, let's start off by going through how much this thing costs and what you get for your money. So I've seen it listed typically for 1,900 US dollars. The Australian price does vary a little bit. So I've seen it as low as $3,158 and some, um, some retailers who dare to dream are trying to sell it at $3,700. All right, so let's go over what you get for your money. So you get a Nutrix uh, power cable, you get the light, of course, and a set of barn doors. That's all you're getting for that money. All right, let's go over the back. So we've got uh, DMX in, so five pin in and out. We've got a four pin XLR power in for your DC, for your battery operation. Now, according to the back here, that is 14.8 volts. So you can use that for say running off a V mount or a gold mount battery. Now, when you run it off that outlet, you don't get maximum brightness. At daylight, you get 53% brightness and at tungsten, 3,200 Kelvin, you get about 63% of the maximum brightness. We've got our Nutrix in and out. You can run power through the unit. Uh, to other lights, but it is fused at 15 amps. Now on your power switch here, up is for your DC operation and down is for your mains power operation. Now on the side of your unit are your main controls. You've got an LCD screen and an up, down arrow and an enter button. So that's for selecting your Kelvin, selecting your brightness, things like that. But you can also select your DMX channel uh, whether your DMX is 8-bit or 16-bit, you can select things like your, uh, your loss of DMX uh, protocol. So whether it uh, holds its last command or whether it holds its last command for a minute and then goes to black. Uh, you can also select uh, effects. There is an effects uh, menu in there, uh, but it's pretty basic effects. Things like uh, lightning, strobe, uh, television, paparazzi, stuff like that. Not really worth going into. Now the last control on the unit is the flood spot, which is on the back. So we'll just have a look at it in full flood first. So they do say 60 degrees. I'm gonna call it uh, 50, 55 degrees. Uh, the, the, the bit on the outside here is um, not all that usable, but the inside's pretty good. So I'd call it 55 degrees. Uh, it's got good shadows like you'd expect off a good quality Fresnel and it barn door cuts uh, in much the same way that you'd expect any good Fresnel to barn door cut. Now, in terms of the spot, it spots to 10 degrees. So on the back of the unit here is your flood spot control and it's got a good feel to it. It doesn't feel like it's gonna jam, uh, but it's, it's also solid enough that if you had the unit pointing straight down, it wouldn't slide um, up and down in the flood spot. So that's quite good, let's have a look at that. So they claim uh, 10 degrees is the spot. Now the ratio is 4.8 to one. So what I mean by that is in spot, it is 4.8 times brighter than in flood. And that's my measurements. All right, so let's go through the pros and cons first, starting with the pros. And the first pro is it is extremely well built. So it is made out of a shock resistant polymer. So that's very lightweight and very strong. It also looks very stylish. The next positive for me is everything is built in. So what I mean by that is it doesn't have an external power supply. If you want to run this, all you have to do is plug in the power and you're ready to go. Now, despite having a internal power supply, it is still very lightweight. It only comes in at six kilograms. Now there is a downside to it being this lightweight, which we'll cover in a little bit. Now the next positive for me is the balance, all right? So let's say you tilt the light down and you forget to lock it off, well, it's gonna stay in this position because it is extremely well balanced. The next positive for me is the DMX. The DMX is very responsive. It interprets the commands extremely well and is very smooth. So even with this thing running at 8-bit over Lumen Radio, it does incredibly smooth fades to black. And if you're lifting up from black, incredibly smooth fade up. Even if you're doing something like a quarter of a second fade to black, it won't shimmer. All right, so let's get into the cons or the negatives now. And given the price of this unit, I'm gonna be a bit fussy. Now, the first uh, negative I've got, it hit me smack in the face as soon as I opened up the box. I could see it was gonna be a problem. 
and that is the shape of the large barn doors. Now on most barn doors, they're angled out, but these ones are cut angling in. So what that means, of course, is they're not gonna cut the width of the beam, okay? So have a look at that. I've got all of this section here that I can't cut and all of that section there that I can't cut. So that's, that's just irritating especially on a Fresnel, because you're buying a Fresnel because you want to be able to control the light. You're not buying a parabolic dish light, for example. Now, the next thing I don't like with the barn doors is the length of them. They're a bit too short. They could do it being about that much longer. So the problem with that is uh, if you're doing cuts, it, um, because they're too short, the beam actually convexes. So it bends outwards on the cuts. Whereas if it was just that little bit longer, you'd get a straight cut. The next negative for me is the position of the controls. If you've got the light on a light stand, well, the stirrup is blocking your access. Now, I'm gonna to add to that. Let's say you wanna use DMX and you wanna run a Lumen radio receiver and power it off the USB port. Well, the USB port is over here as well. So it limits your ability to tilt the light if you're gonna use that USB port. Now, the next thing I don't like with the menu system is how it dials in a Kelvin it dials in kelvins in one kelvin increments. So if you press the button, it'll go in single kelvin increments. If you hold it down, it'll scroll. Now, if you keep holding it down, it scrolls really rapidly. So let's say you wanna set a kelvin that's here. You can scroll past it, then you have to go back the other way, then back towards it. It's very frustrating to use. Now, the next issue is with the cooling system, and that may or may not be an issue for you. Now, it's a very lightweight unit, so obviously they've reduced the size of the heatsink that's inside. This has a drawback. The maximum ambient temperature that you can run this light in is 35 degrees Celsius. So if you live somewhere where the ambient temperature can get above 35 degrees Celsius, that could be a problem for you. The next issue is the cooling fans. They are a little bit on the noisy side. Now, the next thing that could be a possible negative is how much this light varies with its Kelvin and with its plus minus green when you dim it. So I've got the values up for Kelvin at 3,200 Kelvin and at 5,600 Kelvin. Now, as you can see here, there's not much difference at 3,200 Kelvin. It's more than acceptable. I'd be very happy with it. But at 5,600 Kelvin, there is quite a bit of difference. As you can see, the difference between running at 100% brightness off AC power and 100% brightness off DC power is 725 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at the Delta UV. So there is quite a bit of variation here between 100% brightness and lower brightness levels with the Delta UV, which is your plus minus green. All right, so let's have a look at how it works over DMX. So I'll just give you some background. So I'm running uh, 8 bit, and that's being sent to a Lumen radio receiver. Um, and the dimmer is set to linear, okay? So that's the whole setup. So it's not the best setup. We're not running 16-bit or anything like that. All right, now, if this thing does have a weakness with its DMX, it's in the effects mode. So you can't select your effect over DMX, or if you can, I haven't been able to figure out how to do it. Uh, it looks like you've got to set your effect manually, your special effect, and then you control things like the brightness over the, over the DMX. But I'm willing to make the bet that if you're looking to buy this unit, you're not buying it for the special effects, so who cares? All right, let's, um, let's have a look at how she goes. So let's uh, swing across to this unit. What we'll start off with um, is instant command to black and see if it does any sort of stepping. So that's going from zero to 100% with daylight. Let's go to 3,200. Back to 5,600. Doesn't seem to be any problems there. Let's do a five second fade to black. And five second fade up. All right, let's go two and a half seconds. See how it coats with that. See if it shimmers at all. All right, let's go to one second now. And let's go to half a second. All 
It's overall pretty good. Okay, let's do a hard switch now between um, 5,600 Kelvin and 3,200 Kelvin. See if there's any stepping in the engine. Okay, let's do a five second transition. Let's do two and a half second transition. Let's do a one second transition now. And let's do a half second transition. So the DMX is very smooth. All right, now let's go through all the technical data I've collected. So I did run a frequency meter over this. It is running at 24 kilohertz. So what does that mean? It means it is high speed flicker free. All right, so let's go over our brightness now. So these are the results at one meter. So I'm giving you measurements for both AC operation and for battery operation because it doesn't run at full brightness off batteries. And these are the results for three meters. All right, now let's have a look at our CCT accuracies. So these are the average accuracies at 100% brightness running off AC power. Between 2,800 and 3,000 Kelvin, it is typically out by plus or minus 43 Kelvin. Between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin, it is typically out by plus or minus 54 Kelvin. Between 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin, it is out by typically minus 174 Kelvin. And between 5,000 to 6,000 Kelvin, it is out on average by minus 271 Kelvin. Now the most it was out by in that range was 430 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at our average TM30 color vector scores. So the lowest TM30 color vector score I metered was 93. The highest was 95. Between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin, it comes in at 94.75. Between 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin, it is a constant 94. And between 5,000 and 6,000 Kelvin, it comes in at 93.75. Now let's have a look at our white point accuracy or delta UV. Now, I'm not going to give you averages because this light is bicolor, so it can't track the Planckian curve. So I'm going to give you set figures. At 2,800 Kelvin, which is the lowest Kelvin we can dial in, it came in at minus 0.0027, which makes it a little bit more than a 1 8 correction gel towards magenta. At 3,200 Kelvin, it came in at minus 0.0046, which makes it roughly uh, magenta by the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel. The most it was off the planking curve was at 3950 Kelvin with a delta UV score of minus 0.0069. At 5600 Kelvin, it came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0036, which makes it roughly about a one quarter correction gel towards magenta. And at its maximum Kelvin of, of 6,500 Kelvin, it came in at plus 0 0.0020 delta UV. When I dialed in the light's lowest Kelvin of 2,800, I got 2,863, with an average TM30 color accuracy of 95%, with an average 101% saturation. Here are the CRI scores, and only R12 is below 90. And this is the spectral distribution. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin running off AC power, I got 3,111 with an SSI score of 85. The TN30 color vector test shows a color accuracy of 95% with an average 102% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectral distribution and the delta UV came in at minus 0.0046, which means the light is magenta by roughly the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin running off battery power, I got 2,917 with an SSI score of 86. TN30 color vector testing reveals an average color accuracy of 95% with an average color saturation of 102%. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectral distribution 
and the delta UV came in at minus 0.0023, which means the light is magenta by roughly the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,270 with a 1030 color vector score of an average 94% color accuracy with an average 102% saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution and the delta UV came in at minus 0.0057. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin of AC power, I got 5,204 with an SSI score of 74. TM30 scored a 94% color accuracy with an average 102% saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectral distribution and the delta UV came in at minus 0.0036, which makes the light magenta to somewhere between a 1 quarter and a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin off battery power, I got 5,929 Kelvin with an SSI score of 72. TN30 color vector testing came in at a 93% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectral distribution and the delta UV came in at minus 0.0009. When I dialed in the maximum Kelvin of 6,500, I got 6,471. The TN30 color vector scores was 92% average color render with an average 100% saturation. Here are the CRI scores, R9 and R12 are below 90, and this is the spectral distribution. Right, so that's another gear review done. See you in the next episode, which should be on the Cream Source Vortex. All right, see you then.